Good morning, LSA, and welcome to church. Next week, we will have a special guest. That's right, AB will be here with a sermon called Battle Ready. We have asked him to stick around afterwards, so grab a coffee and catch up with an old friend. While you're hanging out, grab one of those shoe boxes in the foyer and check this video out. When those lids come off those boxes, you have never seen such pure joy. This is amazing. As you can see, the children's faces, they're excited as they open up the gifts for the first time. What makes the gifts more than just gifts is the message that comes with the gift. This is the opportunity for a child to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The mission of Operation Christmas Child never changes. Children are coming to Jesus, and children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. Millions of children around the world are being impacted by these simple shoebox gifts. One box can touch not just the child, but the whole family. So we need you to keep packing those boxes and pray for the children that God will use this in a very special way. So thank you for being a part of it. God bless you. This is your last opportunity to sign up for our five-week series called Better Together and Build Into Your Marriage. It's starting on the 25th at 7 p.m. Check this video out for more information. We've all got some version of a relationship or marriage toolbox. It's filled with the things we saw our parents do, maybe some things we saw in the movies, or just watching other couples we know. And when things get tough, we instinctively reach into that toolbox and pull out whatever's inside to figure out what to do and how to respond. But those tools may or may not be all that helpful. We know marriage is complicated and you wanna get it right and we really wanna help. So each week we'll be giving you another tool to put in your toolbox so you can have a better marriage now and know what to do when tough times come. Join us for Better Together. If you have any questions or need more information, go to our website, lsa.church. And now, let's continue with our morning service.
crumbs Come lay them down at the foot of the cross Jesus is waiting God so loved the world All right, that's a little feel good, a little dance, right? Get me moving. Welcome, welcome everybody. Welcome to Never Say Here and Online. Welcome, why don't you uh, high five somebody, a little fist bump, uh, somebody next to you.
We just can't thank you enough for meeting us right here in this moment and for guiding us each day of our lives. Please accept our offerings and use them to grow your ministry. And I pray that you bless Pastor Brian as he brings today's message from your word. I pray that your love would fill our hearts so that we could help others to feel that power and to love into their lives as you love us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Since the fall of man, we have repeatedly fallen short of the glory of God. After Jesus came, the early church was formed with the intention to go into the world and make disciples. Years later, the Catholic Church was established to further the kingdom of God. Its purpose was to teach and preach the word of God to all the nations. But men have a funny way of messing everything up. Like God's chosen people, we began to fall away from God's truth and created our own practices and traditions. October 31st, 1517. Martin Luther nailed his 95 pieces to the door of the Wittenberg Castle Church and changed the direction of Christian life as we know it. Denominations were born. Lutherans, Calvinists, Anabaptists, Presbyterians, and the list goes on. This was the beginning of the Reformation. Although there are many denominations today, there is only one body and one church. To this day, all who believe serve a living God who is working in all things by reshaping and reforming us into the image of his Son. Semper Reformanda, always reforming. Good morning, everyone. My name is Deb. A question. Have you ever looked up into the sky and seen the stars? Obviously, yes, you have. Have you noticed the falling stars? You notice like, wow, those are just so amazing, so cool. And as soon as that star disappears, what happens after that? You look for another one. And then there's the twinkling stars. They just kind of dance in the sky and they really take your interest, but you can't understand what is it about them that you can't focus on them. They're just twinkling away. I think it has something to do with the hemisphere, uh, clouds, I'm not quite sure. But there's a nursery rhyme that talks about twinkle, twinkle, little star. How I wonder what you are. And then there's the stars, the stars that are clear. You look up and you know they're going to be there. They have a place. And you even start to call them by name. You're so sure of them. You know in, even in the sky where they're going to be. I think that Lakeshore St. Andrew's Church is like those stars, those clear stars that you see, and they have their place. And how do I know? Well, you can look in the foyer at our wall of history that we have been shining bright in this community for many, many years. And you can ask John and Wendy Ream, you can ask Gretchen and Mark Potma, you can ask Becky Ferguson, if we are not shining our light in Africa and in the Czech Republic, you can ask Mike Morenci about the 73 people that are waking up this morning at Matthew House who are refugees and they have a place. You can ask Bob Cameron. Do you guys want to, downtown, do you guys want to uh, get brighter, shine more? Well. Here's how. More and more of you go all in with us at LSA. And by going all in, we, we call all in, really, membership here at LSA. And why is that? Why would that be? Why membership to go and be shining bright like stars? Because it gives you an opportunity to declare. You know, the Bible says that we de the, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. And that is those beautiful stars, creation, pointing to the creator. So we get an opportunity to declare and point people to the creator. You declare every week that you want to be here. You want to worship together. You want to hear the inspired word of God spoken over you. We all know that God can do more with 10% of our resources than we can do with 90% of them. We declare that we're givers, and we declare that this is a place where we can use our gifts and our talents. So now to be a little bit more on the practical side, November 20th, we set aside for Discipleship Sunday. 
And that is an opportunity to come and become a member and declare right here with us with the elders that this is the place that you call home. This is where we call each other brothers and sisters and we grow together. So if you would fill out a connect card on the website today and just mark in there your name, your contact, and just write the word membership or tick the word membership. I will follow up with you. We want you to be all in with us. And if you've never been baptized, this is another opportunity to write on that card. And I would love the opportunity to talk to you about this transformed life that you can declare, just like we sang about. So would you please consider going all in with all of us at LSA and become a member on November the 20th. Look forward to talking to you. Oh, this is wonderful that we're talking about membership, we're talking about baptism. Now, that 20th date is so important because that's when we're going to have our next meeting. We're going to have a meeting, and we kind of planned this together so that if you wanted to vote on the direction of where we're going as a church, you need to be a member. And so we're not having our next meeting until you can become a member. So that's a, a wonderful opportunity. So definitely look into that. Let's pray for membership and baptism this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we have a pastor like Deb who is concerned and um, caught up in this really important uh, task, Lord, that you've given us, which is to baptize, to baptize people and to encourage people to follow you by making a declaration of their faith publicly. Lord, we also thank you for membership for this church, Lord, that we can be all in together. Lord, I just pray that you'd be with Deb as she works through this process with our uh, many people here in the congregation. Lord, that you would encourage her and her ministry uh, to these people. Lord, and that you might bless her in this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. We're continuing along this morning in our uh, series called Semper Reformanda, Always Reforming. Now, this is important. It's important that a church doesn't get stuck in one way of doing things. But it doesn't get stuck even in the following along with culture. And this, this tends to happen. The liberalizing element of, of um, humanity seems to be we always move and kind of drift away from foundational important truths and we kind of ease off on them over time. That seems to be the way that it is. So we always have to be ready to call ourselves back to uh, the foundations, to the beginning, to, to what set the, the direction for us as a church. And the church has known this for many, many years, for centuries. They have realized that if they don't have this process of reforming, they become stagnant or they end up moving and liberalizing over time. And so today, we're talking about one of these foundational important truths that um, the Reformation uh, brought the church back to. Now, they didn't express all of these uh, statements. There's five of them. We call them the solas. Solas just mean alone. So the five solas were these ideas that you'll see through all of these reformational writers. And today we're looking at um, uh, sola gratia, which is by grace alone, by grace alone. We got uh, two texts we're looking at this morning. We're looking at Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verses uh, one, to, uh, 1 to 9, actually. And then we're looking at Romans chapter 9, verses 31 and 32. Let's read them together. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised, uh, raised us up with Christ 
and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And Romans uh, chapter 9, verses 31 and 32. But Israel, who pursued a law of righteousness, has not attained it. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as, a, as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. The word of the Lord read in our midst. Let's pray. Holy God, we come to you this morning to reflect on this important truth that you've revealed to us in your word. And that is that salvation is by grace alone. In fact, that our Christian lives are lived by grace alone. Lord, we just pray that you would help us to dig into this really important truth, um, see the realities of this world we live in, and really be open to you shifting our thinking, changing our thoughts, changing our hearts, so that it better reflects what you teach in your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Augustine or Saint Augustine, as you might know him, especially if you uh, grew up in the Catholic Church, you would have talked about Saint Augustine. That's another way that that name is said, said. Was an important fourth century Christian theologian and bishop. As a theologian, he noticed through personal reflection on his own life something important about a topic we don't necessarily like to talk a lot about, and that is sin. What he noticed was that the temptation to sin was not necessarily in the pleasure of the thing or the action itself, but the excitement, the pleasure in doing something that was wrong. That the temptation was doing something that was wrong, not the thing itself. What he noticed was that sin wasn't need-based. I didn't need this. He said, you know, when you look at somebody that might steal a loaf of bread because they're starving, we might even question whether that was sin, right? They're starving. But most of our sins have nothing to do with need. We're not struggling. We want to do it. We want to do it because there's something of a thrill in doing that which is wrong. Augustine worked very hard to express uh, and expose how pointless sin was and used his own experience i love it when people use their own experience and that's what uh, saint augustine saint augustine does he reveals um, through his own experience as a young man uh, this important truth uh, about sin to others he tells the story of the pear tree he says there was a pear tree close to our own vineyard heavily laden with fruit which was not tempting either for its color or for its flavor late one night having prolonged our games in the streets until then uh, as our bad habit was a group of young scoundrels and i among them went to shake and rob this tree we carried off a huge load of pears not to eat ourselves but to throw to the hogs after barely tasting some of them ourselves doing this pleased us all the more because it was forbidden such was my heart O god such was my heart which thou didst pity even in that bottomless pit behold now let my heart confess to thee that it was seeking the, what it was seeking there when i was being gratuitously wanton having no inducement to evil but the evil itself it was foul and i loved it I loved my very undoing. I loved my error. Not that for which I erred, but the error itself, a depraved soul, falling away from security in thee to destruction in itself, seeking nothing from the shameful deed but shame itself. Again, notice that it is not the sin that limited uh, pleasure. It wasn't the sin itself that gave that pleasure. It wasn't the pairs. The reason for pursuing sin like this is that the human heart is restless. Have you noticed that? You know, I think sin often comes when we're bored. 
Have you ever noticed that? You're really tempted? When, when life is super busy, you don't feel a lot of temptation. You feel temptation when you're bored, when you're restless. And I would suggest to you this morning that all our hearts are restless. They're seeking something that is bigger, something more. They're seeking satisfaction and they're never finding it in the material world, in the things itself. Human hearts go uh, to and fro looking uh, for satisfaction. In fact, some of our workaholism, that working and never ending, is a seeking for satisfaction, for some sort of meaning in life, in the material world. Yetzin continues to make the promise that it will bring exactly what we desire, satisfaction. And for a fleeting moment, this is why we like it, it's so tempting, is that for that fleeting moment, it does. For that moment, you forget about the things of this world, and you can just exist in the moment of doing what is wrong and feeling that sense of satisfaction. But what does it mean that we never find ultimate satisfaction in it? It just goes away. Kind of like a drug, right? Somebody takes a drug and eventually they um, become used to the drug and they need to take more of the drug. Why is it that we can't ever find full and ultimate satisfaction in these things? Well, I like what C.S. Lewis has to say. If we find, in oursel find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. The problem is, is that sin, the very thing that brings this fleeting satisfaction, is also the thing that separates us from the world we were made for. Heaven. So this thing that brings the little bit of satisfaction is the very thing that separates us from the thing that brings us ultimate satisfaction. Now, some solutions were devised in the early church, promulgated in the medieval church, and we find even being told to us today that calls humanity to attempt to cross the divide between this world in which we live and where we only find satisfaction in momentary sin and the one we truly desire. We are always looking for solutions to cross this divide and to get that, to that heavenly place. And every time that humans try to figure that out, we fail. So what is the solution? That's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to discover today how God provides the only solution to help us cross the divide between these two worlds, the world we're in and the world we desire. Let's begin by looking at the problem of sin. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. It may seem strange to us uh, to be going back all the way to Augustine and the 4th uh, century bishop when we're talking about Semper Reformanda. This is a reformational thing, and that was like in the 16th century. So why are we going all the way back to the 4th century? The reason I'm going back is because the problem we're talking about here is a perennial problem. It's one that goes over and over and comes back again and again and again. And the first strong argument against God's grace alone is made in the 4th century. It's made in the 4th century, and it shows itself again in the Reformation. The argument is over the nature of sin and how it impacts humanity. Now, sin is not something people like to talk about. Does anybody here like to have this around the water cooler at work? Hey, guys, let's talk about sin. Ah, nobody wants to talk about that. We even come to church and we go, I hope the pastor doesn't talk about sin today. You know, uh, that was the old school, right? Uh, whole old school way, right? It was, it was uh, fire and brimstone. But I think we, we need to talk about it. I don't, we're not going to talk about it a lot, but we need to talk about it because it's reality. Even though it's depressing, it is reality. We can't shy away from it. And that's one of the things our church won't do. Our church is not going to shy away from hard conversations. There are things we need to talk about. This is one of them, and we just need to go directly at it. So what is sin? Some would say, um, in the 4th century or today, whatever it is, it's no big deal. Christians, they might say, man, you guys get way too bent out of shape over this thing that you call sin. Sin for them, sin for the world, if you would call it that, if they would call it that, would be at the worst some sort of cultural failure. So I think that, that the world today would call something like, and we would agree with this, um, the residential school debacle, the, the, that whole thing, 
I think our culture would say there is sin. Like they would see it as a cultural thing, right? Or it's a community belief that is incorrect, right? We see this in a culture, maybe in the past, they had some sort of belief about uh, minorities. They had some strange belief about um, um, men and women. And we look at that and we go, that was, that was sin. It was bad. It was wrong, right? And, or it's something that doesn't encourage human flourishing. If it doesn't encourage human flourishing for people to be the very best they can be, to be all that they can be, that would be sin from our culture's perspective. But is that all that sin is for the Christian? No, it's, it's much more than that. Let's turn to the text to see what the Bible has to say about it. It says in verse 1 that you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Right off the bat, this text tells us that sin is far more than simply missing out on a fulfilling life. It's more than just something that causes problems in the community. It's even more than just moral failure. It's something so terrible that it results in death. Sin and its consequence, so death, our physical death is a consequence of sin. Our spiritual death is also a consequence of sin. As a result of the transmission of sin from the first human being to us. This is a strange concept. This idea that somebody could sin at the very beginning of time, the very first human, and that that sin, the effects of it, could be transferred to us. Now, theologians call this action, they call it imputation. Uh, there's not going to be any test after this, you don't have to remember it, but it is an important word or a concept. It's called imputation. It's the results of one person's actions being transmitted to another person. Now, first, this seems really unfair. Why should someone else's sin affect me? We have to remember that imputation is also the way that Christ's righteousness is counted as ours. So Christ lived this perfect life. He lived perfectly in God's will. He not only didn't do the things he shouldn't do, he did all the things that he should do. He was perfectly righteous, and imputation is this idea that says that all of what God did in, all, in Christ, all the things that Christ did, the perfect life he lived, that results in righteousness. And imputation says Christ's righteousness is going to be counted to you. Before God, right now, you have Christ and all he lived. That perfect life is yours. That's how God sees you because of this thing. So while well, imputation may seem strange, it seems that God created as, as part of reality, and God uses this part of reality to bring us back into an intimate relationship with him. But sin is more than just the imputation of guilt uh, from the first human to us. It's the result of our actions as well. And this is what Paul is getting at in verse 2. He gives us four phrases to indicate that it's our action as well. Here are the four. When you followed the ways of this world, when you followed the ruler of the kingdom of the air, when you gratified the cravings of our flesh, when we followed its desires and thoughts, by the measure of each of these statements, we're guilty of living in opposition to God and his revealed will. This is just the way it is. Sin, then, in a nutshell, is living for ourselves without care for God's holy standard, setting ourselves up as God in its place. And key into that. What you're really doing in all of this, what we're all doing, is setting ourselves up as little gods that we get to determine how life should be lived. As a result of this first sin and our continued life of sin, two things result. First, all humans by default, by default, are spiritually dead. Every single one. Every person that has ever walked the earth, including you and, you and me, every person that is walking around now, apart from a spiritual relationship, personal relationship with Jesus Christ, are part of the living dead. 
If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you're part of the living dead. You're spiritually dead even though you're physically alive. Their bodies are alive, but spiritually they're dead. As Paul says in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Wages is a really important word. Now, you know what? I always just repeated it and never thought about it. What are wages? Wages are the thing you get at the end of the day based upon what? How you worked. You work, and then you get your wages. What they're saying is, is when you sin, you do these things, you get paid for that. You get paid for those actions. They're just, it's not a good payment. Now, when they die physically apart from Jesus, when people die physically apart from Jesus, their spiritual death is actually matched with their physical death. The two come together for the worst outcome. The worst outcome is e eternal separation from God. Now, as you can imagine, nobody wants to think about this, nor do we want to imagine that for anybody. We shouldn't wish, wish this on our worst enemy. We should all desire for every person to become alive spiritually. They can become alive. This would be a terrible thing not to be. As with all humans from the very beginning, when we see a problem, we try to solve it. You know, this is the bad thing. Usually when you're doing uh, work with husbands and wives, the thing you usually need to tell the husband is stop trying to solve problems and just listen. Right? We want, why, because men tend to get into this problem-solving mode, and often a wife will be just like, look, I just want you to hear me. Stop trying to solve the problem for me. I can solve the problem. I want somebody to partner with me. So just hear me. Listen. But as humans, we try to solve problems, and we want to solve this problem of sin. So let's look at the human solution. Yeah, Romans chapter 9, verses 31 to 32. The human solution can be summed up in two, two ways. The first is to try to reduce the problem of sin. We use our minds to do this, our reason. We go, I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to try to think philosophically about this. I'm going to try to find a way to reduce the terribleness of sin. Because if, if I can bring it down, I can make it more manageable. I can deal with it. So we try to bring it down, and then we try to solve this now smaller problem through human effort. We've already seen that sin is quite a terrible thing. It has catastrophic effects uh, uh, of death at multiple levels. Sin, therefore, is just not, and this is important, is not just a surface-level reality. Rather, its effects are deep and system-wide. But humans are going to try to, again, reduce it and then make it solvable by human uh, issues, uh, human ways. Sin touches every part of the human, so we can do nothing, and this is important, we can do nothing that is completely pure, holy, and pleasing to God. What others will say is, no, humans at their base are good. This is the human argument. Humans at their foundation are good. And they can do really good things that pleases God apart from God. Now, those in the scriptures would say, no, we're not as bad as we can be. But we are, in fact, actually touched and tainted at every single level. So that everything we do, even our best action, is actually touched by this thing called sin. But if applying human logic, we can reduce sin to less than that, that we're not tainted by sin, but rather we can still good, do good things, then maybe we can change this equation. Back in Augustine's time, there was a British uh, theologian named Pelagius. Pelagius tried to solve the human, uh, used human reason to solve this problem. Pelagius taught that what really sin was was ignorance of how to live. This is what our world teaches today. And the church buys into this. That really, when we need to deal with sin, all we need to do is have what? Better education. Have you heard that? Have you heard that? People will say, we got this problem in our community. What we need to do to solve the problem is educate people. If they just knew this, then they'd be better people. And that never works. I, I think this is a funny thing I've seen on the news lately, uh, National Post, um, who were talking about uh, uh, Trudeau's ban of um, handguns. And the, the clip goes at the end, somebody forgot to tell the criminals that, that these have been banned. Um, because they're still using them, and they're like, this isn't working. We're trying to apply something to solve a problem that can't do it. We think that we can just educate people, we can just make a policy but what needs to change are people's hearts. And that's deep. That's not surface. If it was the case that we could just educate people, then the answer is to have a really great example for us to follow. We did, this would be the person, be like this person. 
Grace under Pelagius' teaching is a kind of spiritual education program. Jesus is just a great example for you to follow. He doesn't change anything on your inside. He just sets you an example on the outside that you can be like. Once we have this good example, all we need to do from Pelagius' idea is just work really hard. Be our best selves. And that's a lot of psychology today will be just be your best self. Just, you know, we can work together, we can fix our minds, and that'll solve the problem. Yet people are still struggling, and they're struggling because they're still lost. They're still in that sin. They need an internal fix, not an external one. Now, the Jews had fallen into this kind of thinking themselves. Remember what Paul says in Romans 9. The people of Israel pursued the law as the way to righteousness, have not attained their goal. The Jews were the people most associated with creating a whole culture. If you look at Orthodox Jews today, you'll see this. They've created a whole culture of being moral, of being good, of doing all the right things, of following all the laws. They have every law uh, set out. And yet, what does Paul say? Paul, who was a Pharisee of Pharisees, a perfect guy, he says, you've tried, Jews, and you have failed. You can't do it. They had not achieved it. They had gone farther than everybody else, and yet still had failed. Why they failed? Again, is sin is not an external problem. We often will do this with ourselves, right? We'll have a problem, a sin in your life that you're dealing with. And what you'll try to do is change the external environment to kind of help you. And, and changing the external environment, for instance, if you're struggling with pornography, taking, um, uh, getting rid of a cell phone or not allowing a cell phone in a bedroom or you know, keeping the computer out or putting programs on, all of these things, these external helps can be helpful. The problem is your heart needs to be changed yet. You, you need, because the temptations are gonna still come. So while that's an, a, a good step, it's not enough to truly change your heart. You need something internal. With an internal problem, you need an internal solution. What humans need is a solution that's going to deal with this problem, and that is called the divine solution. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 9. When God sees how bad things have become, when he sees how far humanity has fallen, he has to come up with, if he's going to save us, he has to come up with a response that is equal, equally or greater good than what we did was bad. So however bad we are, that's why when people say, well, sin isn't really bad, then the solution does not need to be that great. But if sin is truly as bad as we think it is, God has to do something unbelievably powerful, unbelievably good to counter that evil and say, even do something greater. Now, the reason he does this, the reason he's going to uh, counter this bad is what it says in verse 4. Because of his great love for us, he loves every single human being. Every single human being that has ever lived and will ever live, he loves. And he desires them to have a relationship with him. And think about how painful that is for him to be rejected by the very ones that he puts his heart on his sleeve and lets them see how much he loves them. And he says, come follow me, and they don't, and this is hurtful, but he does this, he does whatever he does because he loves them. Surprisingly, God doesn't force us to pay for our sin. This is a huge idea. He doesn't cost, how many people here would think it's fair if somebody else that committed a crime that another person who was innocent should pay the price for that? We don't, we hate that kind of thing. We'd, we'd cry a foul. That is wrong. That's not fair. Why should we have to pay for somebody else's problem? You know, I think one of the challenges with the, uh, um, in the U.S. right now with the reduction of student debt, maybe you guys have heard about this, and that there just, there's a huge um, payment going out. And there's a lot of people going, I worked so hard to get through university. I put two jobs. I was doing this. I was doing that. And they feel very hard done by because they're like why should i have had to pay and then now i have to pay again for somebody else there's a sense of unfairness about that that people don't like well christianity is all fully based on being unfair 
right? We don't get what is fair, which would be we have to pay for it. Rather, out of God's love, he brings people back into a holy, perfect relationship with him. And that is what is on his mind. That's what he desires most of all. The problem is, his holiness can't just say, hey, no big deal, the debt is just forgiven. You know what? Why don't we just, we'll take this debt, we'll take this slate, we'll just, we'll wipe it clean, no problem, let's just, let's just clean it off, and we'll just pretend nobody saw that, okay? It's not a big deal. To do that would go against his very nature. His very nature is one that is just. It is righteous. It is holy. And it can't just do that. It can't just say, that which is true, we're just going to wipe it away as if it wasn't true. Rather, he says, we have to follow through on whatever this requires. There has to be some sort of payment. He needs to find a solution. And whatever the solution is, whatever that solution is can be defined as God's grace. If you want to know what God's grace is, God's grace is whatever is a solution to the problem of sin. God's grace is the manifestation of God's solution to our sin problem. God is going to do something. He's going to act, not based on what we deserve, not our wages, but based on his unmerited love, his unmerited favor in our lives in order to bring us back into relationship with him. If we had never fallen away, if Adam had never failed, if we had never sinned, grace wouldn't exist. Grace wouldn't exist. Grace only exists as a solution to the problem of sin. It's not a thing in itself. It's a solution. So what we need to do, uh, what is needed? What is needed is we, somebody has to pay for sin. And how do you pay for sin? The answer is death. Death is how sin is paid for. And we see this through the whole Old Testament. If you go through the whole Old Testament, you see a lot of blood in the Old Testament. A lot of sacrifices. There were thousands of animals being sacrificed like on a daily basis. This was a part of the culture. The sacrifices for sin were weighty. Animals had to die. Animals had to die. You had to take that innocent lamb and you had to cut its throat. And you had to see the blood pour out. So when you sin, you're like, I did that. We've been separated uh, from the reality of this in a way the Jews were never separated. It's kind of like um, with hunting today. I was listening to a guy who went on his first hunt. And that was out hunting. He had spent seven days trying to get a caribou. And on the last day, uh, he gets one. He kills a caribou. And the minute he said he pulled that trigger, he felt terrible. He had never gone hunting before. This is the first animal he's killed. And as he walks up to the animal, he sees it and he starts to cry. He said, all these emotions start coming out. It's really strange. And then he said, and then we started getting down to the animal and we started carving it up. And then he said he noticed that it was just really started to look like meat. And he had realized he had been separated from the reality of his life is dependent on the death of other animals. They needed to die so that he could live. In the same way, we have separated ourselves from sin. We don't understand that sin itself causes death. And the Jews knew this because they could see the life going out of that animal. Each time that the, the, um, the Jewish priest would gather the sins of the people and ceremonially put them onto that animal, and that animal had to die. In the Old Testament, this was how people's sins were paid for. God established this as an interim solution. The problem was they had to keep making these sacrifices over and over. Why? Because they kept sinning. They kept doing what was wrong. They needed a better sacrifice. They needed a better sacrifice that could deal with sin once for all. And God found that sacrifice. Remember how great it had to be. It had to be greater than our sin. And the only place he could find that was in himself. Sin was so bad so putrefying that the only thing that could reach down far enough into the grave to bring us back out was himself, specifically in the divine Son of God, Jesus Christ. The unmerited gift that God gave, the gift that keeps on giving because he exists eternally as a sacrifice for us, 
is the grace embodied in Jesus Christ. It says, it is by grace you have been saved. What that means is, it is by the blood of Jesus Christ poured out for you that you have been saved. That's grace. In response to Adam's failure and our sin comes the antidote. It's Jesus. And note that this comes not a result of any human work. It's not like we bargained with God. It's not like we did something. It was grace alone. It was just him doing his thing in Jesus. That's it, full stop. God has done this thing for us. We need not twist his arm. We don't need to challenge him. We don't need to try to make some payment. We don't need to add anything to it. People, if you believe you need to be good before you become a Christian, you're not getting it. There is nothing you can do to merit it. You don't get baptized, you don't wait to get baptized until you're a good person, because it's never going to happen. You do it because you want to follow God and thank God for the gift that he's given that costs nothing to you. God paid it already. Look at the text. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one may boast. Friends, I do not have to tell you that we live in a sinful world. All we have to do is go on the news, or we have to look into our own lives, and we can see it plainly. We also know quite a bit about the result of sin. Death is the one thing we all fear, probably above everything else. And you go, I don't fear my own death. Yes, but we fear the death of those we love. Their death is a reality, and it's something that we see, and we are all, we are all on a on track to one day deal with that. Nobody here is going to avoid death. We are all going to die. And we are going to die, and we are all along certain, a certain stage along that journey. Some of you are closer to that day than others. But we are all on that journey. There's no getting away from it. All of us are simply at different stages. As a result of sin, humans are in a dire situation. We are spiritually dead and on our way to physical death where the two will be joined together. What do we do about it? Well, there's nothing we can do. But thank God, because there's something he can do, and he did do. God's grace alone. He chose to enter into creation himself and pay the price for sin, the wages of sin, which is death, and in turn offers us new life. And when I say new life, I mean spiritual new life. So right now, if you've accepted Jesus or you accept him today as your savior, you have new spiritual life. But more than that, he offers you also eternal physical life. That after death, you will be resurrected and given a new body. And just as death, spiritual death and physical death were united, if you become spiritually alive today, you will be united with bodily life, physical life in the future. God brings the both together in eternity. Being saved is not just a spiritual blessing. It's a physical blessing as well. As Paul says, we will be raised up with Jesus and will exist in the heavenly places with him and we will experience all the fullness of his grace, the fullness of all the good things that we don't deserve, but are ours through Jesus Christ. Today, there is nothing you can do to fix the problem of sin but grace alone. For when it comes to salvation, when it comes to paying the price for sin, nothing else will do but grace alone. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, for your heart of love that has reached down into this world. Lord, and has saved us, has given us spiritual life that we enjoy today as believers and as people who aren't believers, Lord, we can all receive that if we will come humbly, recognizing our failure, our sin, and our desperation, and then coming forward and offering our lives to you, Lord, that you might save us, Lord, out of your wonderful grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand and join us in our final hymn. Jesus is mine. 
beautiful hymn to sing at the end, all those wonderful words that tell us about Jesus' love and how we have been cleansed and how great his grace is. If that is something that's moving your heart this morning and you have a desire to make confession and to come to know Jesus as your Savior. We have two of our elders that are going to be here at the front ready to pray for you. If you have any concern that you're feeling sick, that you have someone that you're caring for that's in need, that you're feeling sad and you just want some prayer, also come to the front. This is the time. This is the place for that. Come and enjoy the prayer that we can offer one another. This week's challenge is to thank God for His grace. Bask in it. Enjoy it and praise God for it, knowing that grace alone has saved you. Amen.